let's join Apostle Rick Steele as he ministers a message called Door 1 or Door 2. But I was glad when they said unto me, Come into the house of the Lord. You may be seated. Bless the Lord. I just want to welcome all the visitors their first time here. We're so glad to see you. So glad to see you, uh, uh, Saskia. Derek, amen. Glad to see the Johnsons all up in the house. Amen. <laughs> Praise be to God. Glory, glory, glory. Give them honor where it's due. Amen. I believe that the Lord has a timely word for everybody today. We're going to shift just a little bit here because I believe the Spirit of God wants to address an issue that perhaps you've not considered it in quite so of a digital fashion as we're going to deal with it here. But the Lord wants to begin for you to have eyes that you can discern these things. So let's just begin to pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, this day. We give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you honor. Lord, we magnify you and declare and decree that it is unto you we give the glory. Father, we declare and decree that nothing in this room can operate by the Spirit and the power other than by you. Let the Spirit of truth rule and reign and operate in this house this day. Lord, give your people ears to hear. Give them the ability to receive. Give them their spirit that the word will go down deep. Let it produce fruit and root for your kingdom and for your glory. Let them be able to hear. Let them be able to receive. Let them be able to believe. Let them be able to conceive the Spirit and the word of God. Father, we thank you, Lord, this day. Let the spirit of truth rule and reign like never before. In Jesus' name, amen and amen, amen. Look at your neighbor and say, it's about to get more better. Pastors are using incorrect English in the pulpit. I know I did it on purpose, amen. Glory to God. We're just going to have a good time in the word of God because I believe that the Lord wants to address a couple issues. We're going to talk about some of the things that uh, we talked about previously uh, and it's interesting because we come from a backdrop of the last several messages about uh, the Apostle Peter being supernaturally delivered from a prison. Uh, the Lord sent an angel to deliver him while he was in prison. It says in Acts chapter 12 that he was sitting asleep between two guards. They had two chains on him. He was uh, behind bars. And when the angel came, the angel struck him and said, wake up, get up. Time to wake up. We're getting out of here. Amen. And that is a word to the folks. Wake up because it's time to leave where you are. God is delivering you. Don't, don't go switch your job just because I said that. Don't do that. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but if you are asleep in the things of God, it's time to wake up. It's time to leave the mental state where you were before. It's time for you to start to move on and get your freedom and your deliverance. And we discovered that he was kept by two chains. And we discovered that those chains represented a couple things. We're triune beings that I am made in the image of Christ. I'm made in the image of God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's Three-part being. You are a three-part being. Amen? You have a spirit man. You have a mind. You have a body. Your spirit man lives inside of your mind. Your mind lives inside of your body. Your three parts. Bless the Lord. But the chains were only two chains. The chains represent your physical body and your mind. When you become born again, and saved with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You're a new creature. There's no chain that the enemy can put on you that will hold you, except for your mind, except for your physical body. And so when the angel of the Lord came and stood next to him, it says the chains fell off. Somebody say, this is just review. This is just review. The chains fell off of their own accord. And what we learned was when we studied the word of God, the definition of the word uh, angel means divine messenger, but it also means pastor. What? So that means when a divine messenger comes and stands next to you, or perhaps a pas pastor 
or a leader that God has sent, all they have to do is be in relationship with you and some of those chains that have been holding you will start to fall off. Bless the Lord. And then it said that he led them out from there. And so here's my point to you. Now that we have that backdrop and a little bit of understanding, let's go with what the Lord has given us today. He gave me by the Spirit of the Lord, he gave me 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. And we'll just turn there. Somebody say, when I come to church, I, come to church, I, have, a Bible, I have a Bible, and I'm prepared to study, and I'm prepared to study. His, word. His Word. Amen, amen. I'll start at verse 5. And, okay, it says, now I come unto you, this is Paul talking, I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia, and it may be that I will abide, <coughs> excuse me, yes, and winter with you, and that you may bring me on my journey wherever so I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry, which means wait, a while with you, if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. That's the celebration. For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. The Spirit of the Lord gave me the scripture, verse 16 and 9. A great door has been opened and effectual, and there are many adversaries. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want to tell you this. You need to understand a simple concept in the Word of God. Anytime a door of God is open, there's always going to be an attack by the enemy before you're released. There's always something that the enemy tries to set up before you are promoted. There's always something that the enemy wants to try to do to stop you from receiving your blessing before the manifestation of it. I know what I'm talking about. We didn't just get birthed in the ministry last week. We've been around the block a little bit. This is not our first tour of duty. And I'm here to tell you that if the enemy attacks you, then you need to start celebrating because it means that my promotion is near. Oh, y'all, let, 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 let me see. Watch this. Jesus, destiny, when he was physically, in case you didn't know, Jesus took off his divinity to become man wrapped in flesh. He was not God, he was man at that point in time. He was sinless, but he was a man. And he had to die on the cross as the sacrificial lamb in order to be to sit on the right hand of the Father and be the advocate for us to enter in for us to enter into salvation. So listen to this. This means he knew he was going to die on the cross as the sacrificial lamb. How many people have heard of Judas? Judas had to betray him. It says, it talks about that in John. He had to betray him in order for him to go to the cross. Uh-oh. The spirit of betrayal always comes before a major promotion. Don't get upset because folks are messing with you on your job. Don't get bent out of shape because betrayal has happened to you. Understand that in the scheme of things, God is trying to position you for a promotion. Oh, I wish somebody would get that up in here. Why would you get upset because you're attacked? Maybe you're attacked in your physical body. Maybe you're attacked in your mind. Maybe it's some neighbor that all of a sudden rolls up and start acting a fool on you. But there's something that God has for you that's increase. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Listen to that scripture again. For a great door and effectual has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Notice that Peter was in prison and chained down in order for the miracle to happen on his behalf. Many people want miracles, but they're not in a position to get the miracle. 
I'm going to let that soak for just a minute. Sometimes you have to be in a position to get your miracle so that you can see God's greatness. Instead of having the attitude, I can do it all myself. Don't worry, God, I got this. He says, do you really? Bless the Lord. But there's another lesson that we want to learn here, because we're going to come back and visit this a little bit more. He says, I'm going to wait at Ephesus until Pentecost. There's such a thing as waiting in God. It's called walking by faith and not by sight, because if you knew how it was going to work out, then you would just have it all figured out, and you wouldn't really need God, because you got it figured out. But sometimes you have to wait in faith because God is trying to build your faith. He's trying to build your patience. He's trying to get you to the point where you can receive the blessing. He said, I'll wait here until a certain designated time for a great door. The key word that we're going to be dealing with today is door. I want you to understand that there are doors. So let's begin to understand what a door is. A door is a portal. It is a gateway, it is an entrance of some sort that allows you to go from this room to another room, or from this realm to another realm, from this train of thought to another train of thought, or from where you were to where you're going. There are doors of opportunity, doors of blessing. There are doors uh, uh, that open up all around. There's also such a thing as doors of cursing. Bless the Lord. And that's scriptural. Did you know that you can open up doors unknowingly? Some doors are opened up for you that you didn't know were open. Hallelujah. Before I can get heavily into this, I just want to teach you another concept. It's called the law of agreement. For those that are aware, we understand Agreement is when two people come together and agree. There's a scripture based on it, Matthew 18 and, 19, or 18 and 18. It says, if any two should ask the Lord, he shall do it. For whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, why would we quote that and what does that have to do in agreement? In that statement right there, God is saying that I'm in agreement with you and I'm authorizing you to speak what needs to be spoken. So in other words, whatever you permit, I'm going to back you up. Right. Whatever you don't permit, I'm going to back you up. Right. So therefore, you have to decide whether you're going to allow good, bad, or ugly. Is this making sense? Yes, sir. Okay. So those are, watch this, those are doors that you have the opportunity to either open or close. Very simple. Let's read the scripture again. For a great door was opened unto me of effectual. So that means it's effective. That means it's powerful. That means that there's something of a supernatural power going on other than it just simply being your power. And while I'm on the subject, let me tell you there's only three kinds of power. The first one is God's power. Second one is demonic power. Third one is human power. Human power says, I'm going to invent this, I'm going to do all that, I got this calculated, I got this figured out, etc., etc. But watch this. If you're doing things out of human power only, and you're not including God, that's really rebellion against God. So that really takes us to two powers only either God's power or demonic power. Hallelujah. There is no gray area. There is no, I did it my way like Frank Sinatra sings. It's either God's way and his power, or it's another way, which is not God. Amen? So why would I take the time to say that? Because the binding and loosing and being in agreement opens up doors or it closes doors. My question is, if certain doors are opening in your life and they're godly, wouldn't it make sense to agree with them? If they're demonic, wouldn't it make sense not to agree with them? 
In case we don't know, let's just make sure that we understand them. Demonic means fallen angels that have rebelled against God. So anything that a fallen angel has something to do with is going to be demonic by nature. Regardless of what the person thinks they're doing it in their own power. It's all demonic. Are you all with me? Praise God. Now let's go back and let's look at this in Acts chapter 12 for just a minute. Somebody say, I'm going to get this. Because I still have to do a little bit more review. I want you to see this for yourself. Somebody say, every scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and instruction in righteousness. That I might be made more perfect. Which means more mature in the things of God. Not perfect, not making mistakes. Okay, so that means that this word here, I can trust every single word that's put on the page. It's put there for a reason. It's not happenstance. It's just not somebody be having a poetic license doing their thing and just writing a good narrative. The Lord has inspired it to be put here for your understanding, for your study. That means all the begatting in the Old Testament with the lineages and all the names and all that, yeah, that's all there for a reason. It's just not history. God is trying to teach us something through the lives of these people. Thank you, Lord. So when we look at the scripture, we can look at every dot, every tittle. In fact, it says in Revelation, if anybody removes any dot or tittle from the book of life, their name will be removed from the book of life. So those that rewrite the versions, uh-oh. In fact, if you look up and study scribes, which are the ones that write out, the Lord is not real happy with the scribes because they will change stuff, which has happened. So I said all that as a precursor to verse 6. Acts chapter 12, verse 6. And when Herod would have brought him forth, and Herod was uh, the, the grandson of the original Herod that tried to have all the babies killed when it was time for Jesus to be born. Look, look at that ungodly lineage. Look at that thing. Interesting. Can I go there? Hey, let me just tell you, the same spirit of Herod is what was overturned with Roe versus Wade. Come on. Because it was trying to kill any potential ruler from coming forth into the earth realm. Now, how would they get here except for they come through a portal? Hello? Through a doorway. Ladies, let me tell you something. You all have parts that men don't have. They're not just parts. They're doorways from the spirit realm into this realm. In fact, there's scripture back in the Old Testament. It says every first male that opens up the matrix, which is a womb, belongs to the Lord. So that is a doorway. Why do you think the enemy works so hard to corrupt it and pollute it? Yeah. Oh, let me get back to here. Yeah. That's good. That's good. So the same spirit that was in Herod trying to kill Jesus Christ before he could be manifested in the natural is the same spirit that was trying to kill, I think the number is 64 million, it killed 64 million babies before it was overturned. Bless the Lord. Jesus. Who in that group was the Lord, was the enemy trying to stop from entering this realm because they had a call, they had a purpose, they had something that was going to be godly and impact this realm? Y'all all right? Just keep going. Let, let me get to this. I'm just trying hard to get here. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between Two soldiers, I just want to let you know I'm not making this up, bound with two chains. And here's what I want you to see for yourself. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. And we learned that the keepers are strong men. 
There are such a thing as demonic strongmen. There's pride, lust, there's uh, perversion, there's bondage, there's oppression. There's all kinds of strongmen that are out there. But anyway, not to get into that. Here's the point. The keepers kept the prisoners in their cell. And what we need to understand is that there are enemy, our enemy has demonic assignments to keep you locked in whatever prison he can keep you locked in. If you have a mental issue, the enemy wants to keep you in the mental issue. If you have a hatred problem, the enemy wants to keep you in the hatred problem. If you are divisive in nature, he doesn't want you in unity and agreement because he's got you isolated in the chamber where you are. The keepers keep the prisoners in the prison. That's what their job is. Oh, bless the Lord. Somebody say, keepers are no joke. But we serve a God who's greater. Amen, amen. He came to set the captives free. Anyway, as I was ministering on this, the Lord spoke to me and he said, do you know what the worst kind of prison is? And the worst kind of prison is an invisible prison. You don't even know you're in the prison. You grew up in it. You don't understand that you're in a prison. But those that are not in the prison can see that you're in a prison. It's invisible to you, but it's not invisible to those that are anointed. Hello? Look at you and say, tell your neighbor, my pastor loves me. <laughs> trying, to, trying to teach me something. Right. Amen. And so the invisible prison, let me just give you a couple examples. Hatred is an invisible prison. If you hate somebody because of their skin color, that's an invisible prison. How many people do you know and see on the in social media and the TV that are locked in these invisible prisons? And see, my Bible says that we're all one blood. Mm-hmm. I'm just telling you what it says. Bless the Lord. If that's not enough, if you hate someone because of their color, you're not walking in forgiveness. Right. And the word says that if you don't forgive people, the Lord will not forgive you. So that's a prison. And they can't see it because they're operating. That, uh, that anything that comes to their life is filtered by that prison. The keepers inspect the food. The keepers inspect every package that comes in. Somebody tries to deliver you something that will be life-giving unto you. The keepers are going to look at it to make sure it doesn't interfere with me keeping you in prison. Wow. So why are you surprised when deliverance comes to you that the enemy acts a fool to try to tell you that the word that you're, being, that you're receiving right now will interfere with your life. Well, guess what? It's because they want to keep you in the prison. Right. Yeah, want to keep you in the prison. Let me give you an example of another, of another one. Okay, let's bring it to home. Roe versus Wade was an invisible prison. Why? Because think about the generation that grew up thinking that that was normal. They thought it was normal, not realizing it was based on a lie Mm. and manipulation, and it did not have legal standing. Mm. What? It never had legal standing. That's why it got overturned by the Supreme Court, because they're looking at it from a true legal perspective. And so because it sat there over all these years, the people thought that it's their right. That's an invisible prison that should never have been constructed. And they grew up in it and thinking that that is life as normal. Oh, let me get, let me keep going. Here we go. It says the keepers before the door. Does your Bible say that? I just want to make sure that we're seeing the same thing. The keepers before the door. What was our scripture for today? Our scripture for today is that there is a door was open to me and effectual and behind it, 1 Corinthians 16 and 9, and there are many 
adversaries. Let me tell you where the adversaries are. The adversaries are right here. It says the keepers before the door. Wow. Your enemies are at the door trying to keep you from going to the next realm that is ordained for you. They want to stop your blessing. They want to stop you from going to the next level of anointing. They want to stop your financial increase. They want to stop your expansion of your life and improving of your life. Some people call it crabs in the bucket. Some people call it uh, just talking against folks, just gossiping and being nasty. Whatever form it takes, that is the concept is still the same, that the adversaries are there to stop you before wow. you step through the portal into the next realm. Come on now. And you need to understand this because many people, why, why am I taking such a hard time uh, 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 to drill this down? Because you need to understand this. A lot of people get upset at the people that are acting a fool on them. And their attention goes right there, not understanding promotion is right around the corner. Come on. So all of their focus and all of their energy now is on the person that's attacking them. That's it. It's a distraction. Ah. The purpose of this thing is to get you into pain so that you can't focus on receiving the blessing that's being handed to you. If they can get your eyes off of God, that's, that's the bottom line. That's the enemy it. wants to get your eyes off of God. He wants to get you focused on the pain. Has anybody ever stubbed their toe at night? <laughs> now, come on now. You, I know I can't be the only one coming through the house. They got where I'm going. Clip that coffee table. Oh, Lord, Lord, Lordy, Lord. Or catch a corner of something that you didn't expect. I was getting up the other day and, and left the drawer in my desk open and clip that piece of wood right in the corner, right on my shin. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Let me tell you, you'll know if you're saved, the cuss words don't come out. <laughs> hey, man, I had, I had to bring it back in. Bring it back in. But have you ever noticed that when extreme pain is caused, that's where your attention goes? Interesting how that works. Interesting how that works. So the enemy is very good at causing extreme pain. Confusion or distraction to get your eyes off of God and to focus on the pain or to focus on the problem. Tell your neighbor, the solution is not in the problem. The solution is with God. Amen. Get your eyes off the pain. Get your eyes off the people that are hurting you. Get your eyes off of distraction and the stupid stuff. So what if they're acting the fool on your job? God's trying to bless you with something. Oh. Let, let, let me take it a step further. I'm going to tell you something that might rock your world. People want to get saved so that they can live eternally with God. I'm, I'm going to kill a religious cow right now. I'm telling you, get out your shotguns. I'm going to kill it right now. Wow. When, when we pull this out and kill a religious cow, it's going to destroy a religious thought. That's not true according to the word of God. People want to get to heaven so that they can live eternally. Here it is. You ready? Are you braced? You're already eternal. What? You're already eternal. Do you think God that's eternal can make something that's not eternal? Wow. Your spirit man is eternal. Amen. It's only your body that's destroyed. There's a wow. story in the Bible about Lazarus when he was waiting in, in Abraham's bosom for the veil to be torn down by Jesus Christ. He had all of his mind, his faculties, his emotion, everything he remembered his life. You're already eternal. The question is, are you going to spend it with God or are you going to spend it someplace else that doesn't have air conditioning? Yeah, I'm not talking about Texas. That's the question, which now brings us back to where we go. 
See, here's the question. Is the door going to open up to the blessing or is the door going to open up to the curse? There's only two powers. There's by God's power or there's by demonic power. Every doorway has a pathway or a room that it takes you to. Oh, oh. For the Lord has opened up a door of effectual and there are many adversaries. Think about that. The Lord opened up that door for Apostle Paul, but he had to wait on the timing of God. And the enemies did not want him to go forth into the blessing. So if we understand this concept, because we're eternal already, that, change, that should change your mindset a little bit. Why would I take the time to tell you that? If you really start to take on, just for a moment, God gave us imaginations. So let's use them. Watch this. Realize right now, you are eternal. God made you in his image and in his likeness. You're made in his image, made to be with him. That should change your perspective right now about all the stupid stuff that's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. So what if they have an issue on my job? So what if the enemy tries to cause a problem? It's irrelevant because I'm eternal now. This is just but a moment. That's a different way of thinking. Now, why would I take you, make you have this understanding for a moment? Are you going to spend the, oh, I should give you the title for this message. The title for this message is door number one or door number two. Are you going to spend the, tit the time with God or are you going to spend it somewhere else? Let's go to John. The book of John. Somebody say, this is a real simple message, really. Let's start at verse 7. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Interesting comment. That Jesus would make that comment. You see, the sheep have to go into their pen. The sheep have to go into their designated area that's safe where the shepherd protects them. And all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. So here's my question for you. What defines a thief and a robber? What makes a thief a thief? What makes a robber a robber? They steal stuff, right? They operate in the realm of being illegitimate, illegal, right? Yeah. We're taught to be honest and legal. Let me tell you something about legal legalities. This right here is the most legal document you will ever encounter in your life. The word, people, this world, excuse me, this world right now thinks they got together with legal contracts, with uh, binding non-disclosure agreements and all the rest of that. None of it compares to this. This is the most legal document there is. The more I study this word, the more I'm amazed at how every loophole has been dealt with. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Things that you don't think add up legally are in here. Amen. So I say that to say this because it makes the statement that all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, meaning that they're operating illegally. And the reason why we can do what we do supernaturally is because we're in agreement with God and his word and his way and his power. Therefore, we have a legal status to operate from. It's not illegal. Now, why would I say that? Because it works like this. If you're operating illegally, you have no authority. If you're operating legally, you have authority. If someone breaks into your property that you own, you have the right to do whatever because you are the legal owner of that property. But if someone was squatting on that property and they're not the legal order and they do whatever, 
they'll have a real problem on their hands. He says, all that came before me are thieves and robbers. That means every charlatan, every person that produced magic, supernatural events, all the rest of that, they're thieves and robbers. Only Jesus was legitimate, which is why he took the time to write out all those begattings in the Old Testament. And the first chapter in Matthew talks about the lineage of Jesus Christ so that you understand how legal he is when he came through the birth chain that he did. Okay? Now, watch this. I am the door by me. If any man enters in, he shall be saved. Look at your neighbor and tell them. Salvation, Salvation. is not just a one-time event. What? I thought that once you got saved, that was it. Yeah, well, that's true. You praise God, you got saved, and you got eternal life, and you're blessed, and you will spend that time with the Lord. But, you know, there is such a thing as having added benefits added to you. There is such a thing as icing on top of the cake. If God did nothing but save us, that would be good enough. But he said, I'm the king, and I'm going to bless my people as I see fit, and I'm going to bless you so much that you can't even stand it. Come on now. So look at that blessing that he heaps on top of salvation that we get to spend eternity with him and not in the place without air conditioning. He says, I'm the door, or can I say it like this? I am the means by which you step from one portal into another, port another realm. I am the means by which you go from your normal existence into a higher level of existence. I am the means by which your mind and your capacity increases. I am the means by which everything that you want to upgrade in your life but could not, I'm the way that that's going to be upgraded supernaturally because of my good nature and my good favor upon you. Salvation will continue to save you and take you to the next level when you step through the door of Jesus Christ. Ah, that's good. Hallelujah. Mm. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. I want you to underline, go in and out. We were served underneath a bishop, and our heart was to pray for him. So we asked him, how should we pray for you? And his response was this, and it has unfolded wisdom to me over the years. His response was this. He said, pray that I know how to go out and how to come in. Wow. Let me tell you something what that means a little bit. How to go out and how to come in. In Joshua chapter 14, I believe uh, there's Caleb who's talking and he's saying that, I was with Moses when he was released into this. I was with him for 45 years. He says, I'm now 85, and I'm as strong as the day as when I went out the first time to go to war and how to come in. Going out means going out to get your blessing, going out to get your promises, going out to get all of the things that God said that you're ordained to have and to receive. It's going out with the right mind to do what you got to do in a godly and righteous way in the demonic nation to be able to go out and handle your business and still bless the Lord at the same time. Wow. What is coming in? Coming in means that you understand there's such a thing as order in the house of God. You don't come into your natural house if you've been out going to war and fighting and rolling in the field and mud and, and just acting crazy and then come in your house anywhere and just sit on the couch. No, what do you do? You get cleaned up. You understand you're in the house. There's a different tone in the house Amen. than outside. Amen. I remember my mom telling me, okay, you're in the house now. Let's, let's use your inside voice. <laughs> Bring that down a little bit. Amen. So there's a different protocol in the house than when you're outside the house. There's order. There should be order in the house of the Lord as well. So here's what we have to understand. The keepers are before the door 
to stop you from going out and coming back in to the things of God. They want to interfere. Declare and decree right now, no devil, no, devil. no, demonic, entity no demonic entity shall stop me, shall stop me from, going from going out, getting the, receiving the Lord's blessings, and coming in, and coming in to, the house, to the house decently and in order. And in order. Now, every door that opens is not always a blessing. So let's not make that mistake. Just because the door is open doesn't mean God opened it. Because the devil can open up stuff too. Or the devil, or excuse me, or the Lord can shut down a door that you thought should be open. We have scriptural precedent for that. Uh, Acts 16 and 6, and this is Apostle Paul. He was going to go preach the gospel uh, in Asia. And it says, uh, uh, And when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, we were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. What? You know, and, and here's the thing. To people that don't take time to really study the word, that sounds like a conflict in scriptures. Uh, you know, I belong to some forums and they post questions and things like that. And one of the comments I've heard over time, well, the Bible's in, it always contradicts itself. No, it's, you just don't study, you don't understand it. And so the people that say there's a conflict here, it's not a conflict. Watch this. See, the Bible says that we're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature, does it not? Yes. To make disciples of all men. But here, it says they were forbidden, uh, forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. So that was a door that was closed. Now, why would that be? It seems to contradict the word of God, but it does not. Because sometimes we can do things in human power, uh-oh, and not being led of God. Come on. Even though... It's scripturally correct. It might be your human power that you're trying to do it in instead of being led by the Spirit of God. If you're led by the Spirit of God, you will have success. But if you do it on human power alone, well, you know, it may or may not. Bless the Lord. But we know that the Holy Spirit knows everything because he is the Spirit of truth. And if that is so, which it is, that means the Holy Spirit knew of truths that Paul did not know about. And to protect him and or the ministry, he said, don't go to Asia. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will shut doors in your life that you thought were supposed to be open. And it's there to protect you and to bring life. For the enemy comes, what is the next scripture? For the thief comes but not to kill, but to steal, kill, and destroy. Hmm, interesting. If you run anything through your life, any filter, all the stuff that's going on, whether it's politics, whether it's the world, whether it's business contracts, whatever, all you have to do is run it through that scripture right there. Is it killing me in some kind of way, shape, or form? It's demonic. Is it stealing from me? It's demonic. Is it destroying something? It's demonic. For the enemy comes, not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. That's its mission. Now here's the thing. Every door that's open doesn't mean that it's for you to go through because it still might be there to kill, steal, and destroy from you. See, there's a reason why Venus flytraps trap flies. They travel with something sweet, and the insect crawls in there, and all of a sudden, boop, that thing closes. But the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, as it says in John 16 and 13, howbeit when the Holy Spirit of Truth has come, he will not speak of himself, but he'll speak of whatever the Father tells him to say. He will show you things to come. That's the word. That means that Watch this, because it's in the word, the legal document. You have a legal right to use that scripture. 
So my wife and I, we have a full expectation of knowing what's coming down the pipe so that we don't make strategic missteps. Does that make any sense? Yes, sir. Why would you step into a trap or through an open door when you know it's not God? Just because it's a good opportunity? Bless the Lord. Y'all know stuff changes. Here we go. Back to the portals. We need to understand something. Portals open the door from one realm to another. There is a pathway that Lucifer came by when he fell to earth. Mm. There was a pathway. That's a portal and a pathway. There is a pathway the angels traversed to get into this realm. That's a pathway. We all know about Jacob's ladder, right? The angels going up to and from and coming down in that dream. We all know that, right? Hold up your hand if you know that. Okay. Watch this. How does the enemy start messing with you before the blessing comes? How does he know? Because he can see the doorway and the portal of the angelic host going up and down, preparing for your blessing. And he can't know what it is, but he knows some activity is going on. Let me set up something to try to mess with them so that they can't receive their blessing. He knows by their angelic activity and visitations in your life. Even though you may not see them, he can see them. Oh, Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Let's go to John 14. And I'm going to come back to this in just a minute. John 14 and 1 is a scripture that we typically hear at a lot of Christian funerals. But I, I'm here to tell you that it's not, this is not a funeral. <laughs> <laughs> and this is not a detriment like you think it is. Listen to this. Let not your heart be troubled. Tell your neighbor, stop worrying about the trivial stuff. Don't you know you're eternal? You're eternal now. Any stupid stuff that's trying to hurt you is really irrelevant to the whole thing. And you need to get past the mindset that this is a big deal. It's really not a big deal. It's not a big deal to God. And all you have to do is plug into the source and let him give you his wisdom and how to deal with it. And you'll find that it's That's really good. not a big deal and it never was a big deal. That's good. That's good. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Here we go. In my father's house are many mansions. It's right. It is true that when we go to heaven, the Lord has a dwelling place and it is a mansion. But if it were not so, I would have told you and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Well, I'm going to put it to you like this. The Lord is on the other side of that doorway that he's trying to bring you into. Whatever, let me rephrase this, because I want you to get this. I said that the enemies are trying to keep you from going into the next realm. They're trying to keep you from your blessing. They're trying to keep you from your increase. The Lord is on the other side of that, beckoning you to step through the door, the right door, as led by his spirit. He says, the way you know, I'm there. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Yes, I know that that means the eternal side of things, but it also means your situations. It also means your relationships. It also means everything in life. The other side of that door God is trying to prepare, is prepared a blessing for you, but you have to have faith enough to step into it. It might be as simple as the fact that God is telling you that you need to start ministering to somebody on the street. Amen. That's a door. That's a door of ministry. God is trying to move you to the next realm. He's trying to give you a note. He's not going to give you his power if you're going to sit there in a chair and never use it. But if you move by faith, he'll back you up and give you his power. 
My scripture says signs and wonders and miracles follow those who believe. That means that in order for them to follow me, I've got to be moving for them to follow me. I've got to step into the next realm. Let me go and give you some more stuff. Let's go back. Oh, let me keep reading. Sorry. It says, I go to prepare a place for you. Here we go. The way and where I go, you know the way you know. Now, how would you know that unless you're led by the Spirit of God? If you're not led by the Spirit of God, you're led by your own human willpower, then you will never know the leading of God because you're operating in your power, not God's power. Here we go. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light in the life. And no man comes into the Father but my me. So he's talking about the doorway into that realm. But listen to the words on a practical, everyday level. He's the way. The Lord will always show you what to do in your everyday decisions. He will always show you what doorways to go into. Am I to take this job? I am not to take this job. Am I, am I to uh, talk to this person? Am I not to talk to this person? Everybody that, that comes up to you to talk to you in the airport or someplace strange, they're not there for your blessing. So you got to know who you're going to talk to, who you're supposed to talk to, and who you're not going to talk to. He will show you the way. He'll show you the truth of that situation that leads to life. Let's go back here to John 10. For the thief comes not but to steal, to kill and destroy, but I am come that they might have what? Life. Life. And life more abundantly. Somebody say, icing on the cake. I'm here to tell you we got a testimony brewing that God is good. I can't tell you what it is because I'm not released and authorized to tell you yet. But I'm here to tell you God's getting ready to show up and show out. And you're going to know that God is God. You're not going to be able to play it off anymore. Signs and wonders follow them that believe. They don't chase after signs and wonders. I don't go down to the corner looking for some shaman to produce a miracle so that I might believe something. I gotta get to this. So in order to, for us to understand doors, we need to understand it from something called the law of first mention. The law of first mention is anytime something's first mentioned in the Bible for the first time, we need to pay attention because it's establishing a concept and a principle. The first time this is mentioned is in Genesis chapter 4. I'm going to go pick up the speed just a little bit, so you're going to have to bear with me. Genesis chapter 4. This is the account of Cain and Abel. Uh, basically, in the bottom line, uh, Abel was born. Secondly, he was a keeper of the sheep. Cain was a tiller of the ground, verse 3. In the process of time it came to pass that brought of the fruit of the ground and an offering unto the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstlings. You need to put a note in your Bible and say, first fruit tithe. That's a first fruit tithe. That's what that is. He brought of the first fruit of, his, of the ground as an offering unto the Lord. Then it says, verse 6, he brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. That is an offering. The offering is above and beyond the tithe. Interesting principle. Now, why, would this, why is this so important? Let's keep reading. But unto Cain and to his offering, he, uh, he had not respect. Talking about God didn't have respect Cain's offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why are you angry, or wroth, why has your countenance fallen? Listen to the Lord's response. If you do well, shall you not be accepted? So clearly there was something about the way that Cain gave that was not doing well. He gave an offering and not the tithe. Nowhere in that conversation did it say that Cain gave the first fruit. It just simply he gave fruit. He just gave an offering. He didn't give a tithe. 
Interesting that the first conversation about a doorway is about a tithe, but let's keep reading. If you, do, if you don't do well, sin lies at the... Wow. So the first time door or portal is ever mentioned is when the Lord says, if you don't do well in your giving, sin lies at your door. Or in other words, the portal of demonic stuff is now available to enter in when you don't do well. Oh, they're starting to get nervous now because he's talking about money. Okay. Now let me introduce a second concept to you. The second concept is called the law of last mention. The last time something is mentioned, the Lord is trying to show you where we're going to. He's trying to point you in a direction. So there's a second thing. There's t- we're going to address this a couple different ways. I want to go to the last time door or a portal is mentioned in the Old Testament. Let's go to Malachi chapter 3. <laughs> and I, I, this is not the pastor trying to create something. I'm just telling you what I study. Verse 9, Malachi and 3, 9. Let's start at 10 because I don't think they can handle 9. You can, you can read that one on your own. It says, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse that there might be meat or revelation. Now, let me just tell you something. Uh, we have discovered through study that meat is a type and shadow of revelation. Meaning that when people tithe, and my wife and I have had this conversation many times where we notice the difference between people that tithe and people that don't, they, the people that tithe and give grasp the deep things of the Word of God. The people that don't tithe can't get it. We've noticed that consistently, without fail. So when you're a tither, the Lord opens up your understanding of scriptures. And you begin to see and you begin to understand. Okay? So it says, Bring all your tithes to the storehouse that there might be meat or revelation in my house. Prove this to me. That's the only place in the Bible where God says, Prove me on something. Everything else you have to do by faith. He said, Prove it. Says the Lord of hosts, Will I not open you up the... What does your Bible say? I just want to make sure we're reading the same thing. I will open you up the, well, that's not the word door, but guess what? A window is still a portal. Hello. It's still an opening. And so the opening of heaven is now available to you because you participated in God's economic plan. So let me make sure I understand this right. The first time a door is ever mentioned is in relationship to God's economic plan. The, sec- the last time it's mentioned in the Old Testament is in relationship to God's economic plan. Think he's trying to give you a message? Okay, so let's go on. Let's look at the, first, the law first mentioned the first time it's mentioned in the New Testament. I'll give you a hint. So you can tell your neighbor, you can stop being nervous now. He's not going to talk about money. Folks start looking silly. <laughs> Let's go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. This is the first time it's mentioned in the New Testament. But you, but you, when you pray and enter into the closet and you have shut your door, you pray unto the Father which is in secret, and the Father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. Very, very interesting. So the Lord is telling you to shut the door and not let distractions in, not let stupid stuff when you pray in so that you can have a right mind and a right heart to receive from God. That's the first time door is mentioned in the New Testament. Let's look at the last time it's mentioned in the New Testament. Let's go to Revelation. Revelation chapter 4. Are you guys okay? Revelation 4, verse 1. 
And this I looked and behold, every time we see the word behold in the Bible, what does it mean, class? Stop, look, check it out. Something's getting ready to happen. It says, and behold, a door was opened in the heaven. And the first voice that I heard was that of a trumpet talking to me. It was said, come up here and I will show you things which be, must be hereafter. Verse 2, and immediately I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set upon the throne. Interesting. So you mean that the last time that it's ever mentioned in the Bible is talking about a doorway opening up to heaven, and we can see God, or John could see God. Okay? So let's put this all together. Let's look at what it says in the Old Testament. Let's look at what it says in the New Testament. First time it's ever mentioned in the Old Testament is talking about getting your money right, and tithing before God. If you don't do it God's way, sin lies at the door to come into your room, into your life, by whatever means. <laughs> the last time it's mentioned in the New Test Old Testament, rather, is talking about, try me on this, prove it to me, and I'll pour out you a blessing out of my portal that you have not room enough to receive. Beginning of the New Testament. And when you go to pray in private, God will reward you openly. So close the door on the stupid stuff and get your attention and your focus right. And the last time is mentioned in the New Testament, the door in the window of heaven was opened again and he could see God lifted high and up. The message is clear. If we look at just the first and the last, it works like this. Get yourself in position which, of course, is by tithing. That's one of the things. But get yourself in the right position, and when you do, you'll be able to see God for who he is, high and lifted up. And in verse 2, it said that, and immediately I was in the Spirit. Hmm. Bless the Lord. See, I'm trying to tell you that when you are positioned and you have a relationship with God, you do things his way, you can immediately turn your head and be in the Spirit. You wonder how we prophesy. Do you wonder how we sit there and do that? So we've been asked questions. All of a sudden, what do we do? We look at you, we turn our head, and we're in the spirit. And we're able to hear from the voice of the Lord. Why? Because we have learned to position ourselves in the right way with the portal to heaven, access to heaven, so that he can speak to us, so that we can speak in turn to you. It's just making sense to anybody. Yes, sir. So here's my prayer for you. Oh, I got one more scripture here. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read you what it says. Revelations 3 and 7. This is also Revelations. It says, And to the angel in the church of Philadelphia write, These things says he that is holy and he that is true, and he that has the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts that no man opens. That sounds like a door to me. Why would you need a key unless it's to a door? Hello? So there are things that God wants to open up to you that no man can shut down. He can't take your blessing. The keepers can't keep you in the invisible prison. He wants to bless you in such a way that when he does, you'll see God high and lift it up. And he wants to shut doors that you're not supposed to open back up again. Don't be surprised if the Lord shuts some doors in your life with relationships or whatever. Don't go back and open those things up. Wow. They're meant to stay closed. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So my prayer for you is this. I'm getting ready to close. My prayer for you is this. That you will be those that know how to go out and how to come in that you'll know where to go out to and when to come back and how to come back in order, decently in order, right house, keeping your house clean, keep doing the right things in your house, not messing up your house, the house of faith. Don't bring your garbage in the house of faith. God will deliver you, but don't mess up and dirty up your house. Bless the Lord. Here we go. I remind you of what it said in Joshua. As yet I am strong this day as I was in the day of Moses who sent me. My strength was then 
is even so now today. Your age is irrelevant. I, I told you you were eternal. You're not trying to retire, you're trying to refire. God's going to supernaturally empower you and take you to the next dimension. I want you to be encouraged. Amen. There are some doors that are getting ready to open that are going to blow your mind. And don't you dare just step through the door because it's an opportunity. You better pray and be led of the Lord which door to open up and to step through so that you follow the right path. Be led by the Spirit of God. Because the enemy knows how to bless you too. He'll, he'll, he'll give you a million dollars if it'll get you away from God. So don't play that game. But he must be first. He must be the one that we give honor and respect to. It's his word by his power that we do things. So the doors are getting ready to open. And other doors are getting ready to close. Don't be surprised if some relationships dry up on you. Don't get offended. And don't, under, and don't get caught up with the keepers that want to keep you in the area that they thought that they could contain you at. Say, I'm not in prison. With the Spirit of the Lord, there's freedom, there is liberty, and you can just go. And you can go accomplish that which God said that you accomplished, but you have to wait for the right timing. Wait for the right timing. Let me pray for you this day. Father, this day in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, right now in Jesus' name. We seal that word in their precious Holy Spirit. That, Father, let that word go down deep. Let it produce root. Let it produce fruit for your kingdom. But, Lord, let it be more than just an encouraging word. Let it be more than just an ensobering word. Open up their eyes that they may see the doors that are being presented and the doors that are closing. Let them have a conscious thought as to what you are doing in their life. No more just moving through life as general opportunities or situations present. But Lord, let there be strategic spiritual guidance through each and every door opportunity. And Father, give them the eyes to see the doors that are closed. Let them recognize those doors that are closing. Let them recognize those doors that are open and give them understanding throughout the whole thing. As you said in 1 Corinthians 16 and 9, a great door of effectual is being opened. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that the enemies that would try to stop them are minimized, bound, shut up, and defeated this day. Lord, let them go forth with the blessings of the Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, if you receive that, say, Amen. 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 Glory to God. This has been a weekly sermon from Due Season Christian Church International. For more information about Due Season and other resources, visit us on the web at dueseason.org.